So I would say the, one of the hardest challenges we had was we were working with a lot of volumetric video. Generally, when people do volumetric video, it's usually you know one take, a couple of minutes, or on mobile, it's usually a few second loops. But we just went full on. We shot like over 12, 13 minutes worth of volumetric video content. And when we initially shot this, uh, there was actually no way of getting the volumetric data from MetaStage onto the device. So we worked with a company called Arturis that converted all of, them, all of this footage into OBJ sequences that then we sideloaded all that to the device. So Magic Leap has a limit of how big an app could be. And we, we had to bypass that limit. Magic Leap gave us like their own internal code that allowed us to sideload assets from the terminal onto the device. So we actually have around 60 gigs worth of assets on the app that the package is accessing. So because of that, it was technically very challenging. There's a huge frame rate drop at some point. It literally is pushing the Magic Leap to its 99% technical limit. Yeah, yeah. It, it really was an amazing experience. Um, what I'm curious to know a little bit about is what inspired the story? So, I mean, it's uh, you said that this was one of the scarier things you saw at Sunlands, and I think it's interesting because scariness was never necessarily the intention. Um, I think a lot of people are coming out of it and it's easy to take this experience in as, you know, uh, how we're marketing it, kind of a psychologically taxing, like, thriller, mystery, scary experience, um, because that is what it is on the surface. But I would like to think that we've built in a lot deeper, deeper layers of metaphor and meaning inside that can be deciphered once one spends some time thinking about what happened in there. Oh, it's, um, very, it's very much like an allegory for animal cruelty, which is something <laughs> I was not expecting when I started the experience to go <laughs> full circle. That's, that's interesting that that's how you think about it. Because for me, even more than that, it is actually, I would say, an allegory for AI manipulation. Mm -hmm. And like you a lot of- say parenting too. For sure, yeah, we could go that route as well. I mean, mainly where the content was for this was coming for, there are two routes that led to the creation of this piece. One of them is this idea of being able to make an AR experience that is scalable. Because augmented reality for me is about context. That's the difference between VR and, VR and AR. AR deals with context, VR deals with the lack of context. And with AR, the most important thing is the space you're in rather than the content, and then how the content interacts with that space to begin with. Before this, I did a project called Terminal 3 on the HoloLens, which would take place in an airport terminal. And every time we would take a festival, we would actually build an airport terminal. With this, I wanted to do something where the context was specific, yet still scalable. And the bedroom was the perfect setting, because it's specific and personal for every single person that has a you know, relationship with their bedroom as a space. Um, but most people also have a bedroom. So it has similar qualities like a bed has a flat surface, perfect place holograms onto. So we wanted to build an experience that we could get into people's bedrooms eventually and hopefully create content that even when you're not doing the experience on the app, it transcends and has a ghostly presence and hopefully these rats and characters enter your dreams. So that's, that's the right place to enter your dreams. Um, and the other element of all of this was this idea of personifying AI. I'm really sick and tired at this point of how AI and pop culture is constantly personified and superimposed with human qualities. And the average person, that's how they think about it. They think about it as AI as this being that has somehow agency. Well, it doesn't. Well, most AI that exists today is usually data crunching on steroids with a really artificial storytelling layer on top of it that literally people have writers writing down what the AI will say. It's branching narratives. It's done in the same way we tell stories with these kind of interactive mediums. Um, it's, it has no agency at its own. And since people are manipulated to believe it does have agency, big companies are able to give up the responsibility of the actions of these kind of AIs and machines. And so things like Sophia from Hanson Robotics, I, I despise that stuff. And <laughs> this, is, this is a critique of that. This is all about we're taking the idea of AI manipulation to its extreme. This is essentially a reverse Turing test in which the viewer is interrogated by an AI to see if they're human or not. And they always fail because there is the, the idea of an AI of trying to figure out your humanity is absolutely absurd. So I was going to ask you, like, are there multiple endings to it? But I think you kind of answered that. 
Yeah, I suppose I kind of did. I mean, this is heavy so, spoiler so content there, as well. Oh, I would, yes. I would Heads really up. Hope. We're going to say in the beginning of this interview, tons of spoilers. Yeah. Um, if you want to check out this experience without the spoilers, you can see it at Sundance. And where's it going next? Eventually, we would take it to a couple more festivals, but I'm hoping that it, mid this year, we would have it available on AR Kit, AR Corp, and Dance Beyond the Magic as well. Yeah. So people so will we, actually we will be able reach, to see this we, on We will the get this out to people, indeed. I, I don't understand how that can be possible. Because, and I, again, this is a spoiler interview here. There's the key, that key element where you take out a key. And I guess you could do like a key on a table or something. I like think that, make it basically longer. like there are a lot of elements that make the most of us being able to control the space and us being in this setting. But then there are a lot of elements that being in someone else's space actually bring to the table. So we may not have a specific element that we had here, but then the fact that it's in your space adds another layer of meaning. Uh, the fact that multiple people can be doing it at the same time has a layer of meaning. So I have to do some thinking about how we bring it to mobile, but I think there's something really interesting about thinking about every phone that is experiencing it as a node, as a point in the particle cloud that forms AI in a way. Yeah, like how it all, exactly, and how it all connects. What was the budget of this piece? Um, so initially we started with around $300,000, I mean, if you count all the production that goes into building the sets and having live actors and things like that, I would say it goes up to around half a million dollars. Jeez. Well, you see every cent in the piece. I highly recommend people check it out in person because they're just elements that can't port over. It's, and it's the human element. Like, at the end when the kid popped out, it's like, oh my God, he's real. He's real. And that ends that moment of like the AI that you thought was like fake becoming a real thing. It sort of reminded me a little bit of Interloop, which I saw yesterday. Have you seen this? I've not seen it. You need to see this because there's so much synergy between the I two see. pieces. Uh, but they're both completely different. So that's like the really interesting thing. Both of you are using this volumetric sort of thing. Um, do you think other pieces you do in the future are going to be in volumetric or are you going to do 360 still? I mean, this was fully volumetric video, right? yeah. and uh, Terminal 3 was also volumetric video, we did that with that kit. Um, I find myself very engaged with volumetric video and the kind of reality it's able to capture. So, I mean, we're adding things like retracking and all the polygons can look around and whatnot. Um, but still, I, I like the authenticity that comes with actually capturing actors in the space. Um, I see myself doing more motion capture this year as well. So it's a really nice show. What is the post production process like? Like, do you, um, can you see this in an editor, or do you have to have that headset every time? It's painful. It's very, very painful. Um, so, as I said initially, when we started working with this volumetric video, we decided to shoot at Meta States without even having a way to get it on magically. Yeah. And it was a huge risk. But you found that pipeline. You yeah, created we, that pipeline. We created two different pipelines for this, actually. So Microsoft, we encouraged Microsoft to build a plugin for the Magic Leap, which they have at this point, and um, it's not released yet, but they gave us access to it. And um, on the other hand, we had a company called Arcturus that worked with us to make these open source sequences. The sequences. And, um, yeah, so we eventually got it working, but it's it's very heavy, very time consuming. With the Arturus stuff, initially the pipeline was so challenging that uh, you would have to bit bring in these texture files that would actually only work on a map feed. So in the editor, you would not see anything at all. You would have to build it to device to see the holograms to begin with. And the iteration time of getting it from Unity to onto the device was over an hour. Um, How you, big is the file? Um, as I said, we have around 60 gigs of assets side loaded onto the device, and then the package is accessing them through the disk memory on the So device making that itself. for mobile is going to be a trick. Um, so the nice thing about making it for mobile is that we would actually not be using kind of OBJ sequences we're using right now. We would actually be using volumetric video, which ends up being MP4 files that end up looking volumetric. And so that's a lot lighter. So the capture you think looks better than maybe what you saw in the magic, potentially? Um, I think it looks pretty good on the magic table, honestly. Yeah. I, I, you'd be surprised. Um, but yeah, I think in other scenarios it might, might look even better with the font screen and everything. But we, we definitely have lighter ways of displaying it. Since the Magic Leap is so new, there weren't pipelines ready for it. So we had to go this route. But uh, that, that's not the same thing with mobile. Um, what is the next project on the horizon? Um, if you could talk about it. Yeah, there are a bunch of things I'm thinking about right now. Um, 
I would say one of the things I'm really interested in is characters more than pieces in a way, like building a character that like goes on and like lives outside a piece. And I know a lot of people are talking about it. It's not new. Like of course, there's Micro over here that people are considering, and then Edward Saatchi and Fable Studios recently they released their plans for Wolves and the Walls. I don't know if you're familiar with that piece, yeah, but nice. um, so like essentially there's this whole new idea of like intelligent avatars. And I, I don't quite put this in that world yet. I think it's slightly problematic to do the whole, oh, this avatar is intelligent thing, because it's the same problem as personifying AI, in my opinion. So it has to be done right. It has to be communicated that this is a character and it has a public persona and whatnot. But I kind of want to, I have some ideas of building in something like little Michaela, but mine with augmented reality doing really complex motion capture and bringing it to the cultural side it's not about bringing it to your room necessarily it's about bringing it like making giving it a cultural presence so that's this is, I'm not saying too much about it but that's kind of the something I'm quite intrigued by over the next year um, I'm curious to know uh, you talk about characters just now I love the actors in the piece I think the actors are all spot on um, I'm curious to know you chose two non-actors for the main role and then for like the rat god goddess figure you chose Poppy yeah. is there a specific reason why you wanted someone who's like a well-known figure to play that role yeah so I wouldn't so I wouldn't say that the child and the mom are non-actors they are actors um, but, but they're super known so yeah they're, they're not they're not super known necessarily I mean the intention with those actors was that we don't want them to be super known I yeah. mean like the whole point is that you take them as this mom and child relationship oh, yeah. and like we don't want to spoil that by it being something you recognize um, the idea of using like kind of a celebrity cameo was started like it was initially when we started the project it was there and it was about how do we build it in and part of it of course like it helps with marketing it helps with getting new media out there to people because they come in because they know someone in there that they're familiar with yeah. but one of the other big things was that we were considering AI manipulation we were thinking of manipulation more broadly and like kind of this idea of like perversing celebrity was really intriguing like how can you market a piece make it about seeing a celebrity but you never really get to see that celebrity and the piece keeps telling you it's not going to let you in because you're not human and eventually you get to see them but not in a way you imagine. so like we wanted to do something like really manipulative around that and i we, we were we had we went through different phases there was moment when I when I initially decided to start it, like thinking of this role, um, me and my writers we were just like, you know, we wanted to get trial about to play that role. That that was what we started off with. It was half a joke but then it became pretty serious. Then eventually we reached out to him and he had a movie here and wasn't quite working out. Um, and then I thought about a bunch of other options till I kind of like uh, someone uh, suggested the idea of Poppy and I've been following Poppy for a while. I, I, I find the character very fascinating. Or yeah. I wouldn't even say it's a character because now that I've spent some time with Poppy, I know that a lot of that exists in yeah, that's her, like her persona. It's like a lot of it is her. And I, I thought that that idea of like playing with, she plays with the idea of celebrity. Like she mm. makes fun of it while being it, right? Like she's like, I want to be famous. Like who wants to be famous? Like things like that. Um, so and and of course the idea of being a robot or an AI or they made me or I was made in a factory or things like that um, her in a glass box things like that so I, I thought it was the perfect fit and I really think the dialogue or the monologue she gives in there that I wrote relatively recently um, how recent like, um, um, very recent like, like three weeks ago oh my god yeah, yeah. so this was still kind of in production oh it was in production ago. until like four days ago man. <laughs> oh my god yeah um but basically, that dialogue just... How do you not have bigger bags of your eyes? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how that works, but yeah, I, I probably should. Um, but yeah, so that, that dialogue really worked out really well. I was quite pleased with it because it carries on her persona while for the first time also devi like deviating from it yeah. slightly. Like, like at the end, she uh, swears. Her. That's yeah. like she, that's she never does that. And, oh. Like initially, we were like, oh, should we do it? Should what's gonna happen? Yeah. But so in that scenario, like I'm very cool. I'm very excited about that one. Thank you so much for talking with me. Hundred percent. This experience is just so amazing. It was like of everything I've seen, it kept me on my toes the whole time with the mystery of like what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen next. 
I think that's exactly what you want out of movies, especially if you are your experience. Where can people find out more information about the company and where they can see more of these sort of experiences? So my studio is called One Rick. Yeah. It's one that does it in RIC. Um, I'm going to link to it in the description below. And my name is Asad J. Malik, and you can find me on Instagram, or Twitter, or on social media. Which one do you like better? Um, I use Instagram the most, actually. Really? Yeah. I like Twitter for my news, and I like Instagram I, for my friends. I think Twitter is probably the most, like, where most of the industry is, but I, I've had a hard time getting used to it. It's, it's, not, I have it. it's, it's, nice. it's like the 360 stuff in there. It just requires, it's, I feel like I have to now say wise things about VR and AR. I'd rather just sit and make things, you know? It's um, true. The visuals so, were I suppose. Um, yeah, and Riot helped us produce this project. Um, I, I mean, I, I think everyone in the industry at this point knows that uh, they're really the ones that are out there helping Riot. creators yeah. make it work. Um, it's hard times, you know, like a lot of production companies are shutting down and there's not all that much money in it. And um, I really appreciate the concept of work. Thank you again so much. 100%. And find him on Instagram and Twitter, although he likes Instagram better.